Hello everyone. Welcome to the 14th episode of the Ziljin Talk with Darshan Doshi. Today as you know we have an incredible drama and uh, I'm very very excited for this episode. Uh I have known him for a while. Obviously everybody knows him who he is and uh, I'm very very excited uh, that he said yes and he's come on board to give us time and to talk to us and inspire all of us. Uh I'm just going to wait for some more people to join in. And till then I'm just going to please this comment and yes perfect. Let's see and that's it. That's good. How's everyone doing? Uh hi Man Vijay, hi Sanket, hi Kalp. Good to see all of you guys joining in. Just going to wait for some more people and before we invite him. As everybody knows, uh he's a Grammy award winning uh drummer and composer best known for his work with jazz guitarist Pat Metheny in 2014 he composed an original drum score for the film Birdman which won several prestigious awards his first album Migration featured artists like Chris uh artists like Chick Corea Chris Porter David Sanchez and Pat Metheny I've also been very fortunate to spend time with him when he visited India uh years ago and also recently watched him live with his band in Vancouver at the Vancouver Jazz Fest and uh, also watched him at Nam uh on my trip earlier this year with his wife Tana Alexa who's an incredible singer so without any further ado I'm going to invite him the one and only Antonio Sanchez Let's see if he's here. Hi, Antonio. Hey, Darshan, how you doing? Very good. Very uh so good to see you here and uh, welcome to the Zildjian Talk and welcome to the Zildjian India channel. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you. It's been so long since I saw you and uh, since the first time we hung out in uh, Mumbai. So th- this is fun. Thank you for the invite. Yes. Uh firstly, how are you doing? Uh how's everything back in New York and how are you uh, dealing with this pandemic? And were you on tour uh, when this was announced? Yeah, I was on tour with uh, Pat Metheny. We were in uh doing a long tour that started in um where did we start i mean it it was australia new zealand then uh it was supposed to be argentina mexico peru brazil chile um anyway we were uh, we traveled from auckland in uh, new zealand to buenos aires and when we were in buenos aires that's when uh when everything started getting out of control and then one country after the other started uh canceling and uh it took us maybe like 3 days to try to find a way to come back to uh New York uh we went through Sao Paulo and it, it was very stressful because you know you had the feeling that you know the infection was everywhere at that moment and then uh got to New York and and as you know New York was in really bad shape for for a while yes. and uh we live here where where I live in uh, Jackson Heights it was the epicenter of the epicenter. So we we were in a in a really bad spot. We used to listen to um ambulances going all day because we there was a there is a hospital here called Elmhurst Hospital and it was one of the worst hit hospitals in in the country at that moment. So now luckily because of very uh disciplined uh you know way of dealing with the whole situation uh by the new yorkers we definitely flattened the curve and it we're in a much better place than other places in the country right now like texas or florida are are you know doing really really bad right now because they didn't want to enforce a lot of things that new york enforced from the beginning and and 
I have to ask how how things uh, in in India regarding all this stuff. Uh, same thing out here. Actually, we started up with a, like almost like a couple of months of lockdown. Then uh, we opened up uh, about a couple of weeks back, but then then the cases are really going high, and uh, you know. Uh, again, the government has uh, issued a couple of cities today, uh, saying uh, another lockdown till uh, 31st of July. So, it's uh, it's just about getting better, and then again, things are opening up, and people are not taking care of, you know, not wearing masks, you know. So it's kind of a little crazy out there as well. Yeah, it's just in high density places like New York or or India. You know, it's just you know, there's so many people. It's very hard to control. Yes. So I wish you, I wish you the best, man. Same, same to you, man. Uh, Thank you. Uh, so tell us, uh, uh, your, you know, we are we're on the Zildjian India page. You know, we wanted to know firstly before we go on to your journey and where you started everything. Uh, how did you connect with Zildjian symbols, and uh, when did you get endorsed with uh, Zildjian? Um, it was a while ago. It must have been uh, maybe like '94 or '95, something like that. Um, where uh, the way it happened, it was I was in uh, at Berkeley College of Music. I was a student, and uh, I had a, a, a very good teacher that started helping me out and recommended me with uh, with a, a competitor of uh, Zildjian in the beginning, and okay. uh, they offered me an artist deal with this other company, and I was of course you know so honored that as a student somebody would be offering me anything. You know, so yes. I accepted and uh, it was one of those, I don't know, maybe a 50 percent deal or something like that. So okay. I went to the factory and they said, choose whatever you want. So I chose a bunch of beautiful symbols and I started playing them. And then maybe like a month later, I got a bill uh, for like fifteen hundred dollars, which back then mm -hmm. I had absolutely no money, nothing. I, I had no money. <laughs> so I was really? like, I, I, I can't pay this. So. At the same time, John de Christopher, that used to work at Siljin back yes. then in uh, in uh, Massachusetts, uh, there was a festival at Berkeley, and then he saw me and he said, "You know, I I'm aware of what's going on with you and this other company. I just want to tell you that we would love to have you, and it would not be an artist discount; it would be a, a full ride." Oh, yes. So, so that's that's when I joined, and then I went to the factory and I chose a bunch of symbols and. You know, it, it's been such a great relationship with uh, everybody that, that used to work there and then they left, got replaced by other people and the new people, you know, like Sarah Hagen now that, that um, I've been working with for, for years now, you know, they're, they're just fantastic people and they really take care of their artists. Right. Also, uh, just to talk about the, the series that you've been using for a while, I when I saw you at the, the Vancouver, uh, Vancouver Fest as well, there were a couple of prototypes as well. So are you working on something uh, with Zildjian for uh, like like a pro prototype which is going to come out for the for other people as well? Not really. You know, I uh, when before all these symbols with a bunch of holes started coming out, uh, I asked Zildjian to make me something and uh, John Francis made me this really, really cool symbols with uh, tiny little holes before the effect symbols came out, I think. Okay. And and he made me three. And I've been using those. And, you know, I'm one of those guys that once I find a set that I like, I, you know, I don't change that much from, from symbol to symbol. I, I add little things and here and there, but my main setup has kind of remained the same for for a while now. Okay, so is it like a, a mix of Constantinople uh, and uh, some flat rides and stuff that you've been using currently? Um, well, the main setup is, uh, yeah, I, I used to use a lot of Constantinopoles. I, I, I still use one maybe, but I've been using, you know, this very old, uh, old K that I bought from, uh, from Patrick Ferrero, who is the drummer of Hamilton. I yes. bought it from him a long time ago and it has a chunk missing. Maybe, you know, anybody that has seen me play has seen me play with that symbol. You know, it has a, I mean, I'll show it to you. It's probably easier. I, ha I have my, my setup right here. Oh, nice. Okay. So, so is this one. Oh yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. So it's a beautiful old K uh, that sounds incredible. And then nice. the prototypes I was talking about. Yes. This one. Also, whoever has seen me play, 
uh, has seen me play with yes, it. So I, I have game. two two of them here. And uh, and this Constantinople I've been using for a while. It's it's actually a ride, but I use it as a crash. It's a medium thin uh, low twenty inch. Nice. Uh, with uh, three rivets. Uh, actually, this uh, no th only one rivet left. The other ones have um, have fallen through the years. Okay. And then oh, here wow. I have a uh, one of those Z bells. I think this is a, uh, yeah. Not not sure if this is a prototype or not. Um, they gave it to me a long time ago. And then I've been using more and more stacks. Nice. So what is this the, one, What is under the uh, Oriental China? Yeah. So this is a uh, custom uh, hybrid trash. Uh, let me see. <laughs> okay. I'm terrible with names. <laughs> this is a custom hybrid trash splash. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah. And it's a 13 inch. And it has uh, an oriental China trash on top. Nice. And then also I've been using this splash. Six inch. Uh, yeah. yeah. Six inch A custom uh, inverted for years now. Okay. This is the, the famous ride. Yes. Really, really cool. And then I've been using uh, other kinds of stacks. This is, uh, you know, the FX, FX stack. But... Uh, you know, sometimes for these symbols, you need like an uh, uh, an extra adapter because they if you when you put two of these as a hi hat, then it gets really thick. So right. you need an adapter. So what what I did is instead of um, using the adapter, I'm using this. It's a it's a sound lab prototype, but it's basically okay. you know a mini China as Got well. It. Uh, and then I put this one on top. And then you don't need an adapter. It fits perfectly there. Nice. And, and, it, and it sounds really, 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 really cool. Um, Lovely. And this one's very trashy. Yeah. And then on this side, I'm using this other stack, which is a custom hybrid splash. It's an eight inch. Right. And then underneath is a 10 inch special recording hi-hat. Oh, nice. Which I, I don't even know if these make, they make these anymore. SR10, bottom hi-hat, and it's special recording. Nice. And uh, hi-hats, you know, I, I go back and forth between a bunch of them. Uh, this one I've been using lately, a custom special dry, 15 inch. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I switch back and forth. Like I, I also love old hi-hat. So I have this, um, this one that is, uh, this is an old K. Okay. The bottom. It looks but like I've a carob using... though. Yeah. Yeah. That's a carob. That's like super old. And yeah. this one, uh, special, uh, custom special dry effects on top. Yes. And and it you know it's, it's just a very different kind of sound. So you know I I, I like switching back and forth. Uh, and the cool thing is that on my on the left side of my kid now, you know because I use uh, three snares, you know yes. one a deep one then a smaller one. And this can be a piccolo or a, or a soprano, and right. then the regular snare over here. Uh, I can be playing on the left side of the kid only. And and uh, between the three snares and the stack and the hi hat, it gives me like so many possibilities just on this side of the kit, which uh, which I love. And then this one is a really cool stack that I started experimenting uh, recently, which is um, a special uh, custom special dry trash crash. This is 17 on top of uh, left side right. Wow. Okay. So K, I think it's a K special um, left side right. Yeah. So custom left side right, and that's nice. a twenty-two inch. So the cool thing about this kind of uh, stack is that you know I I play a lot of jazz, of course. You know, so yeah. one cool thing that this gives me is that if I write here, I still get you know like a. But then if I wanted to, to play something with more, uh, you know, um, 
I don't know, some backbeat or something. Yeah, almost like a stack. So you have this area of the symbol which allows you you know, to play a bunch of different things that are more jazz oriented. And then this one, uh, when, you, when I hit it, then it gives me a completely different uh, kind of, uh, you know, a, a weapon to, to yes. use in, in, a, in a different context, right? And, and this has been my configuration for, for well, this is a Phoenix Yamaha kit. So nice. I've been using 12, 14, and 16 for a while now. Right. Uh, my my three snares. I have my pedal with a tambourine. I used to wear a cowbell a bunch. Yes. Um, and my double pedal. What's the bass drum size? It it looks like. Uh, Listen, like eighteen. Eighteen. Okay, eighteen by. This, eighteen by uh, by sixteen. I okay. Uh, but you know that keeps changing, so I have right. my my twenty over here. Yes, uh, and I, I have a, a like a really old bass drum that I had from before, uh, and you know here in my studio, I have everything set up so that I can just you know open Pro Tools and start recording. I have everything ready, everything's mic'd uh, constantly, uh, like the snares, everything is um, mic'd on the top and the bottom. Right. You know these ones too. What are, what are the main mics that you're using for kick drum and snare drum? So kick drum, this is, um, uh, and um, ah, man, I'm telling That's you, I'm so bad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Our, uh, this is an RE20. Okay. This is an RE20. Okay. And, uh, and yeah, this is uh, the, the, the beta one. And yeah. then I, I use um, Shure mics on the, on the toms, these little ones. Yes. These are the, the sensory percussion triggers that I've been using too. Lovely. And then uh, this Neumann's as overheads, I have three. Okay. And one more on the, on the hi-hat. And, um, and uh, what else? I think that's it. Do you any then, time prefer miking like the right or the hi-hats below? Like, or it's always from the top for you? It's always from the top. Okay. You know, I've I've never really liked the sound uh, it creates from the from the bottom. The bottom mic, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and uh, with the three overheads, then you have pretty good control on uh, you know the stereo imaging and how you want to project the kid. And okay. then if we keep uh, going here, I, I have like a little um, assortment of nice. cars and that I've been using a lot for for. A film score that I'll I'll tell you about later because it has it's an Indian film score. Oh, lovely! So, okay. Yeah, and this is a a guitar that Pat Metheny gave me uh, a few years ago. Nice. Uh, and I've been using it a lot too. This is a, a mini, <coughs> sorry, a sub fatty a Moog. Moog, yeah. I I, I love Moogs. Lovely. And this is a, another Moog. It's called a Matriarch. Which is also I'm I'm discovering new things to do with it all the time. Are you also using setup. any room mics, Antonio? For no, the no, the, I think the room is too too small for okay for room mics. Um, and I, I have you know that's a stack that I have that um, you know I I go to depending on what I want to do. This is these are the ones that I use the most. Uh, so this is you know this this would be my main setup. And then right. if I want different sounds, like for example, I have this uh, flat right, right here, and they custom nice. twenty that um, you know I, I use a lot for for different effects and stuff. Uh, and then this ones like big uh, chinas or swishes. Yeah. Depending on what I'm playing or what I'm recording, I also will will switch. Especially this one, I'll switch to Constantinople and put one of those big swishes just so right. that I can do a roll, you know, from the drums from the beginning to the end and then end on one of those big uh, chinas with a bunch of rivets and it just sounds amazing. Um, what else? Some some more effects. This is a this is an old A. 
really old, old day that uh, kind of sounds very bonham -y. John Bonham, yes. you know, when I crash on it, super cool. Uh, these are some custom symbols that, that I've acquired from, you know, different places. So there's, there's a K custom. This, this was like one of the first symbols that I used to use because I, I was wow. more into, into rock and fusion. Right. So it, it's cool to have this really pingy symbol because now that I play jazz, you know, I, I rarely get to to use those things. True. Uh, and, yeah, and a custom, you know, some uh, um, just assorted ride symbol that I, I like to kind of change up every now and then. And, Are these and all handpicked by you at, from the factory? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've gone a lot nice. through the years. And, and this is my basic setup here with, uh, I, I use Universal Audio Apollos, which are great uh, preamps. And then I have this um, uh, keyboard, which is um, a complete control ADA from Native Instruments. So that's how Beautiful. I control all the, all the plugins from, from the computer. So, you know, it, it's not a huge setup, but it's, it's more than enough for, for what I need. Absolutely. Amazing, amazing. Thank you for the studio tour. Yeah, man. My pleasure. So, uh, going back uh, in the day, like, you know, uh, if you can talk about your influences and uh, were you always into jazz fusion music or it happened much later? It happened later. Uh, in the beginning, I, I was very into rock and roll. So, I used to listen to everything my, my mom used to listen to. So uh, the Beatles, Rolling Stones, you know, Ringo Starr would, would be my first influence, probably. Then Charlie Watts, uh, then Led Zeppelin. Uh, she used to listen to Janis Joplin. Um, then I discovered Rush and the Police, you know, with Neil Peart and Stuart Copeland. And, and like most drummers, you know, I got completely obsessed with those two for, for years. Uh, and then one day uh, I discovered the Chicory Electric Band with, uh, with Dave yes. Weckl. And and that blew me away because uh, I was into rock and roll, uh, and you know first like I said it was Ringo and Charlie Watts was you know more basic, uh, you know keeping the beat kind of drumming, and then when I started listening to John Bonham then I was like okay this is this is a different kind of drumming, you know who who uh, is not only keeping the beat but really really you know uh, taking a very active part in in the communication between the band members, and then. Even more when I discovered Neil Peart and Stuart Copeland, you know, they had very distinct drum sounds and, and uh, you cannot have the police without Stuart Copeland or Rush without Neil Peart. You know, it's just impossible. Mm -hmm. So I, I really liked uh, bands that had very clear identities with the drummers, you know, that you could, you could recognize the sound very quickly. Uh, and then when I discovered the Chicory Electric Band, Dave Weckl also had a very distinct uh, drum sound, of course. And, and because of Weckl, then I started going through, uh, you know, Vinnie Kalayuda and Steve Gadd and Dennis Chambers and Billy Cobham. You know, that kind of very, uh, uh, you know, virtuoso, virtuoso uh, drumming that I was really, really, uh, you know, taken uh, aback, you know, by the amount of, of um, skill that all these drummers had. So that's when I started really practicing hard in order to get more technique and more chops and stuff like that. But, you know, it was it was a very um, slow process of me getting to there. I, I played in, in rock bands for a long time before I even discovered all that stuff when I was living back in Mexico. Right. Uh, so I've also heard that before you, uh, you, you went to Berkeley, you were also kind of uh, uh, part of a uni in, uh, in, in New Mexico, right? But you were learning piano and not drums. Yeah. No, but this is not New Mexico. This is Mexico City. Okay, Mexico City, yeah. Yeah, yeah I was born and raised in Mexico City. Yeah. And uh, yeah, when I was 15, I started taking piano lessons because I saw the movie Amadeus and I got obsessed by, by Mozart, you know. So I wanted to be like Mozart and I wanted to write symphonies and stuff and play the piano. Uh, but I was always playing the drums at the same time. So I... Um, got myself into piano lessons and then I got accepted into, into the conservatory, but to study classical piano and classical composition. 
Uh, so a lot of people in school didn't know that I played drums, which was was funny, you know. So they saw me playing piano, and then there used to be a yearly jazz festival in the school. And one time I asked if I could play with my band, so everybody assumed that I was going to play with the piano. And yeah. then I showed up and played drums, and everybody was like, you know, you played drums better than you play piano. Maybe you should, <laughs> you should, <laughs> you should do that. <laughs> and, you know, I, piano for me was like a, a really cool uh, and a very necessary thing to to learn and to understand and to study classical music and learn about structure and forms and 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 how uh, you know a symphony is built all those things that at the moment i didn't understand that were going to help me so much later on in life when i became uh, a composer and a, an arranger and a producer and, and and stuff like that but yeah it was it was uh, you know very good four and a half years that i i was in the conservatory studying piano uh, as a major wow uh, so once you came to Berkeley, you know, I also wanted to know, and there are a lot of musicians from India who are kind of getting into the scene. Like, it's how important is for a you know any musician or a drummer to get into a university, uh, something like Berkeley or MI or you know, if you can share your experience about that. Well, how important it is to get into a place like that? Yes. Well, uh, you know, of course, if uh, if you can go to to a good school and and study with good teachers you know uh you should you know if 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 it's in within your possibilities but a lot of times you know uh it's it's very hard to leave your country and then go somewhere else and and start a new life like that it is very very complicated so if you can i would say yes do it but you can also you know improve a lot you can also learn a lot you can you can explore a lot without having to go anywhere now thankfully we have the internet which is an incredible tool for for uh, drummers to check out other drummers to learn uh there's almost too much information you know uh but it's uh, uh, it's not a requirement to go somewhere else if you want to improve. You can improve from wherever you are, but you need some guidance and, uh, you know, a, a good teacher will always be helpful, of course. Right. I feel, obviously, as you said, information is pretty easy uh, in today's time, but uh, I think the uh, the kind of musicians that you must have met during that uh, course of period that you were there, I think that also does also impact your music and uh, you kind of also make a lot of contacts, right? During that period. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, one of the greatest things about Berkeley is that, you know, you graduate with, I don't know, 5,000 students or something like that. Uh, and then a lot of those students, you know, move to back to their countries or move to New York or move to LA. So when I got to New York, after I graduated, I realized I knew so many people already that were established here uh, and in L.A. And uh, I would go to Europe and perform over there and I would run into, you know, tons of people that I went to school with. So the tentacles and the reach of, of Berkeley, you know, is, is pretty amazing because it's uh, as a music college is probably the, the biggest one. Right. You know, uh, when I was there, there were like 250 drummers. Now there's there's more. Uh, wow. in my generation. So it's a very uh, tough and competitive environment, but it's, you know, it's, it's never going to be as tough as when you get out and you, into the real world. You know, that's when, when you, when I came to New York, that's when really uh, I realized how, how, uh, you know, crazy the competition is here and, and it makes you grow, you know, as a player and as a person, definitely. Uh, so after Berkeley, uh, you were, I think, learning with uh, Danilo Perez, right, if I'm not wrong? And uh, yes. then you actually kind of, you were learning, but you kind of started, uh, uh, you became a part of his band and you were touring with him uh, the next year, I guess. So how did that happen? Right, right, right. So, you know, after I graduated from Berkeley, which was in 1997, uh, well, actually, right before that, I, I had become friends with uh, with Danilo, who, for, okay. for those who don't know, is an incredible uh, piano player from Panama that played with many, many people. Uh, lately, with a great Wayne Shorter, he, he, he was in his band wow. for a long time, and with Dizzy Gillespie. 
uh, in the United Nations Orchestra, and then with Paquito de Rivera for a long time. Right. So, you know, I became friends with him because he was uh, uh, living, he still lives in, in Boston, and he was teaching at New England Conservatory, which is right around the block from yeah. Berkeley. So I had become friends with him just because of our, like, you know, our, our love for music and, and our Latino connection, obviously. Yeah. Uh, and uh, when I, uh, right before I graduated, we went on this little tour of Panama, which was like a okay. student tour with, with Danilo. And, and we got along great, and, and it was a great experience performing together. And I remember on the way back from the airport, we came back from Panama into Boston, and then we were driving uh, together in a cab because, you know, he was going to drop me off before going home. And he told me, well, uh, somebody called me for a recommendation for a drummer, and I gave them your name. I'm not sure if they're going to call you, but, you know, uh, hopefully they will call. I don't want to tell you who it is because I don't want to get you too overly excited. Okay. So, like, okay, you know, and I had I, I was just about to graduate from, from Berkeley. And then a couple of days later, I got a phone call from uh, Paquito de Rivera's management offering me this long tour in Europe with the United Nations Orchestra, which was the one that Dizzy Gillespie uh, was leading right before his death. Wow. So then Paquito kind of took over and uh, they needed a drummer and uh, they called me and, and I went on tour and did this, did this amazing, you know, long month, uh, month long tour in Europe, all the major festivals. And, you know, it was, uh, that was exactly what I wanted to do. You know, it was like, a, finally, you know, my dream is coming through touring with a, with a famous jazz musician, you know, playing, playing really cool music. And then I came back and my visa expired because I'm, I'm, I was Mexican. Now I'm, Mex yeah. I, I'm also an American citizen, but back then I was just renewing my visas all the time, all the time. So I came back and uh, my visa expired and I forgot that I had to apply for what they call the practical training, which allows you one more year after you graduate to work in the United okay. States. So I forgot, I missed the deadline and I came back and I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do now? And then luckily New England Conservatory offered me a, an amazing scholarship to go and do like a master's there wow. uh, so i went back to school and they the program i was doing allows you to have two private teachers but you know one thing that i i uh, recommend to drummers at some point is to study with people that are not drummers because obviously we tend to study with drummers right so we always have the point of view from another drummer so what I wanted to do is with, to study with somebody that would play another instrument and they would give me their point of view on what they needed right. from me as a drummer, but what do they need as a piano player or as a saxophone player. So I studied with uh, George Garzon, uh, uh, who's an incredible saxophone player, and Danilo Perez. So... Um, you know, it, it was kind of uh, an evil plan that I had to learn all the music from Danilo and then come prepared to the lesson and then ask Danilo, hey, Danilo, so, uh, you know, how does this tune of yours go? Like Panamonk or something like that. Hmm. Uh, oh, yeah. And then I would start playing it. And then I knew it, of course. And it was like, oh, you know it? I'm like, yeah, kind of, kind of. Oh, yeah. So let's play it. So then our lessons would be a lot of just about playing a lot of his music. And then I would bring a bass player and we would play his music. So, you know, without him knowing it, he was kind of training me to be his drummer. Wow. And then one day it happened that his drummer back then, who was uh, Jeff Ballard, he couldn't make a couple of gigs in Paris. And, you know, I already knew all the stuff. So then I did it. And then one thing led to another. And that, then I ended up playing with him for, for a few years. But that's that's another good piece of advice that I can give to people, you know, uh, if you can hone in mentally uh, on who you would like to play with, you know, and learn all the music, learn all the music, because you, you never know when you're going to get a chance to, yeah. to um, be in the right place at the right time. And if it's somebody you really, really want to play with, then you will be uh, prepared. And, you know, you never know where those kinds of opportunities are going to lead you. Wow, that's great advice. Uh, 
Okay, coming to Pat Metheny. Firstly, I'm a very, very big fan uh, of the music that you do with him, and uh, especially the DVD that came out. I think live in Korea. Uh, I think it completely changed uh, me as a musician on how I really wanted to. If I ever wanted to do a band like that, it, it needs to be presented in this particular manner. Even if it's jazz music or fusion music. it completely it's it's like basically a, a university that you can if you watch that dvd it really trains you to be a better musician uh tell us about your experience first with obviously you know working with him for so many years and what things go behind uh when you prepare an act like that like you know well um that particular uh video you're talking about is uh, from an album called the way up yeah, yeah. and and uh, for those who don't know the way up It's an album. It was the last album we did as the Pat Metheny Group, and that was okay. already 2005. Well, yes. they actually the, we recorded the album 2003, I think. Um, but uh, it came out 2005. We did a long tour, and uh, the video we recorded was in Seoul, in Korea. Yes. And that to, that that particular piece is a through composed piece. So once we start, we never stop until oh, yeah. the end. You know, so it was a really, really cool thing to do uh, because it, it was like um, being part of a play or a movie, you know, where you get to develop every, something over an hour and a half almost without stopping. Because, you know, in, in pretty much any context, you get to play tunes, right? If, you, if you're in front of people, you play a composition, then stop, then you know regroup for a second then yeah. play another one and and the whole night goes like that so you have little breaks but to get yourself in the mind frame of okay, of okay this is a marathon we're going to run a marathon now and it's going to last an hour and a half it it, it would put uh, my concentration and i think everybody's concentration uh, at a completely different level and it was a, a very very complex very complex piece of music and when we would play it live it would be to a click most of it wow. so yeah so because it had sequences on top yes. and back then it was seven of us on stage uh and everybody had choreography you know with different instruments i remember i i even played bass bass <laughs> yeah towards the end of the piece yes. because you know everybody was you know playing so many things there were 23 yeah. guitars being played through the night by by wow. different people and pat played like 10 i don't know and uh i remember when we got to that part in the rehearsal they were saying well who's going to play that you know and uh and they looked at me and, and like you're not doing anything <laughs> and i'm like okay give me the bass i'll i'll try and you know i i i play uh you know a fair amount so it it was not a, a hard part or anything So it, it was just fun, you know, to 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 uh, have that kind of choreography going on. But the very funny thing that happened to me was that, you know, just like everybody else on stage, everybody was so concentrated on what they were doing because it was such a hard piece of music that I never pay attention to what anybody else was doing. You know, I was just really, really Focusing. into what I was doing, and you know, I would glance sometimes, but I was just into the music. And then when I saw the DVD, I was like, "Wow, this band is amazing!" You know, <laughs> <laughs> because I never really understood, you know, yeah. how, the level of complexity of what everybody else was doing, as well. So, you know, it was a really cool thing to be a part of, and we must have rehearsed maybe for. four or five days but when we rehearsed we we already everybody knew the music by heart you know we all knew the music very very well so it was more like a okay everybody knows the dance steps and then we all get together and yes. we work on the choreography together but it was uh, it, it was an incredible experience unfortunately it was too many gigs in a very short amount of time so the the tour lasted maybe like uh, five six months but it, we would be doing seven eight gigs a week sometimes wow and the gig was an hour and a half or more an hour 45 of this piece and then blah, 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 we would finish bravo bravo and then pad would introduce the band real quick blah, blah 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 
and now we're going to play, you know, some of our old hits. And then we would play for another hour and a half, uh, almost wow. straight. So it was between 3.15, three hours and a half each gig. And yeah. back then, I, uh, you know, I was definitely younger. And uh, I did not really know how to pace myself. You know, I would be, I would get so excited by the music that I would give it 150% every night, which you should, but I would do it in a very uh, raw, animalistic way, right. almost. So I, I would just plan my evening. So by the end of the concert, I was dropping dead every night. You know, I had no energy left. And and I started having physical problems. You know, I never got to the nineties or anything like that. But I would ha get all this back pain, and and my legs would be hurting, and my ankles would be hurting because I was just hitting too hard. You know. Right. So um, after that tour, I took a little break and and started trying to figure out how to be more effective on the drums without having to hit so hard, and uh, and um, you know save myself from from injury. Because those tours would be, you know, just uh, too too intense, uh, right. and and they would last, you know, a fair amount of time. So, you know, I I, I had to learn how to pace myself, basically. Right. Uh, talking about you know doing back to back concerts and you know playing for three hours, you know, uh, there was a question by, by a dear friend called Joe Jacob from Bangalore saying, how do you maintain that posture? You know, even whenever I've seen you play, you are always very your back is straight, shoulders down, relaxed, and you know, how do you maintain that posture for like three hours on a gig? Well, like you have to be very conscious of of that uh, because I remember when I started playing jazz uh, early on, I would you know I, I would change my position a lot. I would raise my shoulder because right. ding ding ding, you know, it just felt good, you know, to have a little bit of attitude whenever I was playing. And then I, I started realizing that, oh, by the end of the night, this is hurting, you know? Okay. So I, I started trying to make adjustments, especially when I had to play for, for, you know, three and a half hours. You know, if I didn't do those kinds of adjustments, then, then I would suffer a lot by the end of the night. So every time you sit down and play, you have to be very aware of, uh, you know, things that you're doing right and things that you're doing wrong. And if you feel like there's things that you could improve on, then you need to make that that adjustment. And, and that's really for self-preservation, you know, so that you can play longer, have a, a, a longer career without pain, yes. uh, which for a drummer, you know, it's uh, when you hit 50 or 60 and you've been playing hard and absorbing shock for years, of course, you know, you could have you could have problems. So then you have to find ways of how to be the most relaxed and the most effective while you're playing, uh, because you, you, you can overdo things very easily because emotion takes over. Right. right? And, and you're like, you know, you get into the music, which is that's why we play music. But when you're doing it day in and day out, then you have to to be careful about certain things. If you only do one gig a week, then you can give it your all and then you have the whole week to recover. Right. But if you're, right. if you're doing a tour, you know, you don't have time to recover and then you're playing in front of a bunch of people every night that, that played money to see you. So right. you have to be a very responsible, uh, almost like if you were a high performance athlete, you know, you, right. you, I, I would get massages every time I could on the road. And, and just try to be good to your body, you know, sleep as much as you can, uh, eat well, because on the road is very easy to not sleep and eat, and start eating a lot of crap. Yeah. And that starts taking a toll and drinking, you know, yes. or, 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 or doing a anything else um, that will hinder your performance. You know, like I, I never really drink before a gig, you know, after a gig, yes, I, I'll have a drink. But before a gig, you know, I feel like because we are the timekeepers, we really need to be, you know, 100% uh, there. Uh, also, I always wanted to ask you, like, whenever I've seen you perform, uh, the dynamics is so amazing, like, especially the last Vancouver show that I saw, uh, where you did like a, about a 10 minute uh, drum solo. Uh, how do you still maintain that posture in the sense of, 
you know i have a habit like whenever you kind of play uh, maybe a little soft or something like that you your your back kind of tends to you know bend a bit you know and uh, how do you maintain that dynamic uh, you know approach during the drum solo and what what is the uh, composition uh, approach because I, I i i always feel that you are kind of saying some kind of a story when you are doing a drum solo so is it planned or uh, it comes on on stage while you're doing it so I, i'm glad we 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 touched on this i mean i'll start with the posture thing uh so i i did gymnastics for a long time i i was part of uh, the junior national team in mexico uh, for for a couple of years and i love doing like floor exercise and you know doing the flips and 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 all that stuff and but i hurt myself quite a bit my lower back uh was injured you know uh in in a way that it has become kind of part of my life you know i have okay. to deal with this back injury uh that i i i'm i'm okay but if i sit down for a long time if i stand up for a long time if i do anything for a long time my back starts hurting so i need to to keep stretching uh constantly uh so if i don't keep a really good posture where my my back is very straight if i go a little bit this way then it starts hurting okay and if i go a little bit the other way it starts hurting so i i need to be like right in the center okay. of my balance like where it comes the most natural and then and then my back is okay So that might be part of why uh, if you ever see me play I'm usually you know in that position to avoid further injury to my back. Yeah. Uh and, and then when it comes to to uh dynamics and all that stuff you know from from uh playing jazz a lot playing in small places playing in small places with no amplification where I'm playing with a piano trio or something like that sometimes I would do tours in Europe with Danilo Perez for example. and play like a church in Italy you know with a piano bass and drums and the drums were from 1950 uh with heads from 1950 in this <laughs> tiny little town in Italy you know back in the day you know like in 97 98 um and you know that of course it was very difficult you know because i couldn't hear the piano the drums would resonate a lot in a, in a, in a very uh, boomy place like a church or or a big hall and i had to learn how to control my sound you know and uh especially play, playing piano trio in those kinds of places it was, i i had to do it you know it's kind of uh, uh just uh, just to survive the the situation to survive the gig so there's an interesting so- story um uh with that happened to me with uh, charlie hayden And Charlie Hayden is a legendary bass player. You know, he used to play with uh, Keith Jarrett and you know with Pat Metheny too. Right. And he was famous for hating drummers that played too loud. So he would bring plexiglass, and if you play too loud, then he would put play- plexiglass around you <laughs> <laughs> because he had he had tinnitus. You know, he he had a, like an ear thing that, that right. bothered him and and. Uh, so he didn't want to risk it and he would just plexiglass you and uh you know and and we played at the village vanguard which is you know the the most famous jazz club in in new york and it's a very small place and uh you know you can hear a pin drop so i was you know very conscious that okay i'm going to have to play extra soft this week because charlie hayden you know wants me to play soft so uh the repertoire were mainly uh, uh ballads and boleros and stuff like that so it was a lot of brushes you know so right. that was fine but i didn't want to play the whole night with brushes so then by the second tune i started playing with my sticks but i was being so so careful not to overdo it you know and i was yeah. and I, and i was actually so tense because i could never go like this it was all like you know <laughs> half motions Yeah. and and i was like oh, you know it was, it was just really hard uh and then we finished the first set and we were backstage and then charlie said antonio man can i talk to you for a second about the the volume and i'm like oh, shit. he's going he's going to plexiglass me and then <laughs> and then he he said you know it's great but can you play a little louder because i can't hear you you know wow. i'm like yes great That's you know <laughs> So so to me that was like okay so I got into a point that I can really really control my volume you know uh yeah. and uh 
but it was something that I, I definitely worked on. And then when it comes to to uh, like uh, what you were talking about, like at the end of uh, Birdman, where I would do like an extended drum solo, and it would go from 10 minutes to 20 minutes sometimes. Yes. I like to start with uh, absolutely nothing, you know, concrete in my head. I I, okay. I, I just know I'm going to try to develop a story, like you were, yeah, you were saying, right? So for years now, storytelling has become one of the main things that I want to do uh, on my instrument and in music in general. When I write music, when I improvise music, it's all about storytelling. And, and uh, storytelling, you know, if you think of it uh, in, in musical terms as your speech, right? When you hear somebody uh, reciting a, a very good speech, you know, like, a, I don't know, John F. Kennedy or, or, or um, uh, Martin Luther King, you know, one of their famous speeches. It's like, it grabs you, it takes you in, and it's very clear, you know, and it makes you feel something. So how can you do that as a musician, as a drummer, especially? You know, because obviously a piano player has harmony, has melody, uh, and has rhythm, right? And we tend, tend to think of drums as we only have rhythm. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of times I, I'll start a clinic, a drum clinic, by asking people, okay, so how many drummers do we have here? And then 95%, hey, cool, okay. And now how many real musicians do we have here? And then <laughs> they don't know what to do. They were like, <laughs> uh, should I raise my hand or not? And, and, and I say, well, that's precisely why I'm here because I want you guys to think of yourselves as musicians that just happen to play drums, but you're wow. musicians first and drummers second, you know? So that, you know, having that frame, frame of mind that, okay, I have this instrument that I need to make music with, then you start seeing drums under a different light, not just like, okay, how fast can I play? Because after seeing hundreds and, and hundreds of drum clinics throughout my life, uh, I started realizing that so many of them are just geared for people to learn about technique, learn how to play fast, learn how to play flashy, look at how big my drum set is and how many things I can do. Right. And my single strokes are faster than anybody else. So, okay, that, that's cool. Uh, you need technique, that's, that's for sure. But I see technique as just a tool for you to make music. So... The cool thing about storytelling in music is that you don't need to have, you know, the technique of Vinnie Colaiuta or Dennis Chambers or me or, you know, you can deal with whatever level of technique you have. And it's just a mindset. How can I use this technique in order to tell a story? And, uh, you know, I always tell people, okay, there's a few things in music that in order for you to make music, always need to be there. One of them is uh, a, a motif. A motif is an idea, right? Yes. Any, any idea, rhythmic or melodic, that's a motif. And then you need repetition. You know, you need to repeat the idea in order for you to establish it. Right. Uh, and you need space. Space is one of the things that make the music... Uh, feel like music. And then you need question and answer. In other ways, um, you know, you say, okay, how are you doing? And then you say, well, I'm fine, right? You don't say, how are you doing? How are you doing? I'm fine, I'm fine. You know, you don't, you don't repeat <laughs> things that way. So one very uh, easy example that I, everybody knows is like, okay, what would you say if I said, dun, 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 Da 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 da. Da 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 da. Exactly. So this question and answer, but it's the same motif. It's the same idea, right? right? So he. This is Mozart, of course. He exposes it and then answers it, and he has a whole symphony just based on that. Um, so when you are improvising on, on the drums, that's exactly what what you should be doing. You know, exposing something leaving space, thinking about what you just did, repeating it, uh, adding stuff to it. And then all of a sudden, what you're playing 
starts getting some sense of organization, you know, um, because otherwise what I see a lot of drummers do is like they're playing something and then they switch to something that is absolutely unrelated to the first thing they were playing. And then that way is like if I'm talking about, uh, you know, how to build a solo, but I love scrambled eggs in the morning. They're, they're great, you know. One thing absolutely has nothing to do with the other. But the beautiful thing about this kind of thinking is that you can get from developing a solo to a scrambled eggs. You can't do it with transitioning, right? So with a good transition, you can get away from going from A to Z, you know, really, you know, something that might not re be related apparently, but you can make the transition. So this morning I knew I was going to come here and talk to you about, you know, drums, but, you know, I wanted to make sure that I, I was cool and, and, and I wanted to eat something before we start our conversation. So I made myself some scrambled eggs and, you know, now I feel much better and now I can talk to, to you about, you know, anything. So it's just a, a simple uh, example of how to transition from A to B without sounding completely abru abrupt. So one of the main things that I uh, try to do now is this storytelling, whether I'm writing, whether I'm improvising, uh, whether I'm playing with a band, where I'm playing by myself, is all about trying to tell a story, developing your characters in the story. And that's the only way people are really going to follow what you're doing. Otherwise, that's what happens when you're playing something and then people start looking at their phone because they already got bored. And there's right. more interesting things to do somewhere else rather than listening to what you're doing in real time, you know? Right, right. Wow, this is amazing. I think uh, a lot of drummers are going to get some really great insight of how to do a drum solo now, for sure. Uh, Antonio, if you don't mind, uh, it's about 57 minutes right now. Uh, can I restart the session? Because it's going to stop in three minutes. And I have a small Q&A section where drummers had sent some uh, questions for you. Uh, I can restart the session and you can just join, join in back. Let's, let's do it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you guys uh, for sticking by. I'm just gonna add Antonio again. There are some uh, really cool questions that you have, you guys have sent, and I really wanted to uh, ask him all these questions. So I thought it'll be a good idea to just restart this session. Just gonna wait for Antonio to join in. I think he's here. Uh, let's see. Yes. Welcome to part two. Part two. Uh, okay. Uh, coming to uh, Birdman, uh, I think one of the only drum scores uh, in a Hollywood movie. And uh, you kind of completely changed how you can look at a, a film score just by using drums on it. So how was the whole experience? And if you can talk about uh, the, the recording sessions and how you went about that. Uh, it was an incredible project. Um, you know, when, when Iñárritu, the director, called me, you know, I was just so honored to be a part of it. And then I was terrified <laughs> to be, <laughs> you know, trying to score something, you know, that big with just a drummer, uh, a drum set. But I knew, you know, he knew what he was doing and I just, you know, trusted his instincts. So the first thing that happened is that he, he um, well, we actually got together in a studio in New York before they started shooting the movie and okay. we worked with the script. So we did the whole movie with the script, but he would explain the scenes to me in great detail. And then he would just have me improvise, you know? And uh, so I was just reacting to, he was telling me to the storyline 
And, and it was a really weird, unorthodox process. Yeah. But uh, then he grabbed those demos. And uh, when he had the rough cut of the film, he chopped them up and then superimposed them. Then they showed me what they did. And then uh, we were able to hone in on things that he really liked. You know, okay, I want more of this. I want less of this. And now yes. we were watching the movie. So uh, we would, um, you know, do things that would be obviously going with the, with the image. He would say, okay, whenever you see this happening, then I want something big and I want an okay. accent. When you see, you know, uh, Michael Keaton turning the corner, you know, those kinds of things. Right. So it, it was a very quick process. Uh, it was like a day and a half only because I was just improvising. You know, I didn't have to actually write any, any music. I was just reacting to the music. And uh, and it's been fun because whenever I do it live now where they project the film and yes. I, I do the whole thing from beginning to end, um, the cool thing is that because the nature of the score was improvised, then that's how I do it live. So every performance is different. And I base it, of course, on, on what I did. Uh, and I make sure that the dramatic effect of uh, what we achieved is there, but I change it up all the time. So each performance is uh, completely unique. So, uh, you know, thanks to Birdman, then I got a call to do like a Spanish documentary. Uh, I did a, a British film uh, and I did recently uh, a, a TV series that lasted three seasons or three years, yes. uh, Get Shorty. Get uh, and it was mainly drums uh, and it was also mainly improvised. You know, I would just look at the scenes and I would do everything here in my studio and then, uh, you know, just just do two or three takes of, of each scene. And it was very drum centric. But one of the problems about, uh, you know, having done Birdman is that people think of me as the drum guy, right? So if you want yeah. drums for your movie, yes, of course, call Antonio Sanchez. Exactly. But if you don't want drums for your movie, then why are you gonna <laughs> call me? So I, I wanted to get out of that, you know, so I started yeah. doing a lot of demos and, and sending them to people. And and recently I did a, a very cool movie, which, you know, I'm happy to talk to you about it because it all happens in Mumbai. You know, the name of the movie is uh, Harami by this uh, great director called um, named uh, Shyam uh, Hadiraju. Yeah. And uh, it's about a, a, a gang of pickpockets uh, yeah. that uh, operate in the main station. So he really liked drums for those pickpocket scenes. You know, he really liked Birdman for that. But then he had all of, all, all this other scene that, you know, he didn't really want drums for. Right. So I thought that was a perfect opportunity for me to showcase some of uh, my other composing because I have eight, eight um, albums as a band leader where I write all of the music and, yes. and you know, it's, it's an um, involved composition. So I wanted to, to showcase some of that stuff. And uh, the, he liked, you know, string instruments. He liked guitars, all this other instrument that had nothing to do with drums. So uh, it was a really good opportunity for, for me to, to play all those instruments, to, to record. I'm not a mandolin player or a nude player or a ukulele yeah. player by any means, but uh, I have a, a musical enough mind that I could overlay a bunch of tracks of uh, of all these instruments and guitar and bass and keyboards and strings uh, and drums of course that uh you know would sound like a like an actual film score so i'm really looking forward to it coming out next year and that uh, people get to hear another side of my composing uh that is not necessarily so drum centric so it's a really really cool movie really well shot uh, and i hope people will come out and see it Wow, this is really exciting. I'm really looking forward to check out the movie, especially the score for sure. Yeah, me too. Uh, if you can also talk about your, uh, you know, uh, playing with Ustad Zakir Hussain and uh, when you came to India, just a, a small brief about how was that experience? That that was one of the craziest experiences of my life, man. That, that was amazing. And I was talking to, to Zakir the other day, actually, uh, about that, about how I will never, as long as I live, forget those days in in Mumbai that you know you, we were hanging you know you and me were hanging and I remember you took me to the to the to the um, a boardwalk and we were hanging yeah, there we went and, to the and, marine uh, drive I remember exactly. the walk <laughs> yeah you know it, it was it was such a cool experience and we played in Dubai first and then we played yes. in Mumbai uh, but 
when we got to Mumbai, you know, I, I it was my first time there. I never, I didn't know what to expect. And, you know, he puts this, this festival in the honor of his uh, father, of course, you know, um, who is like a, a god, you know, in, in, in the percussion world. And he invited me to be the Western drummer that year. And uh, I, I didn't know exactly what, what was going to happen, if I was going to play with somebody or if I was going to play by myself. And Sakir was so busy that, you know, we didn't get to talk to, uh, about right. it too much. But, uh, you know, this festival, I think it started at like at six in the morning yes. and went on like to two or three in the morning, I, I remember. Yeah. Uh, and the day before the festival, I remember I got my sheet for the sound check time and it said 4 a.m. <laughs> and I thought I thought it was a mistake. I thought it was 4 p.m., of course, you know. <laughs> right. So I, I asked somebody, so this is a mistake, right? It's 4 p.m. Oh, no, 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 no. It's 4 a.m. I'm like, you know, I think I'm going to skip sound check this time. <laughs> so <laughs> so I went to the festival. I must have arrived like at noon. And there were all these incredible percussion players. And each one would play for an hour, an hour and a half, you know. And right. they would start really slow, you know, this, you know, older gentlemen and, uh, yes. you know, playing uh, the tabla. And it, it would start very slow. And I was like, well, you know, it's understandable. He's old, right? And, and then... <laughs> Within half an hour, <laughs> it, it was like levitating from from right. you know this incredible technique and the you know it, it, I was just blown away, you know, and I, I was listening for the whole day before my show, yes. and um, so I was incredibly inspired, you know, incredibly inspired by everything I heard, and then when it was time for me to play, I finally got to talk to Zakir and and I asked him so Zakir I'm. I'm guessing I'm playing by myself, but you know how how long should I play? And you know I'm used to playing ten minutes, twenty minutes. You know I've done a lot of drum clinics where I do extended drum solos, and he said, "Well, you know I think you should start with an hour." <laughs> and when he said that, I was like, "What? <laughs> start with an hour? That you're crazy? Oh yeah, yeah, just start." But you know. I was actually so inspired but from what I had been hearing and all, all these ple people stretching, you yes. know, really for an hour and a half that I was like, okay, so it, this is my chance to really explore, mm -hmm. you know, the space and to explore the audience in a different way. And I started playing, you know, with my hands and then to brushes and then to rods and then to sticks. And I really, really took my time. And, right. uh, and it was one of the most well-educated audiences musically yes. speaking, in the planet, you know, there's so many percussion players and they were counting, you yes. know, as as the performances were going on. So every time they would they would understand that I was doing like an eight beat cycle or a 16 beat cycle, all of a sudden, boom, I would hear a, a clap. And I was like, who did that, you know? And then again, <laughs> boom, and everybody, I was like, wow, this is incredible. So then I started playing with that. You know, right. and then I would start slowing down, and then people start slowing down with me, and they would laugh. It, it was just, you know, an incredible, incredible experience that I hope I can come back and and repeat it someday because it, that that will forever stay with me. Yeah, I think for even for me because you know, uh, I was uh, kind of blessed that you know Ustad used to always uh, tell me to be with drummers. You know, when whenever each year the drummer used to come and. Uh, and by far, I can say, I think your solo that day was, I think, one of the finest piece of drum solos I've ever heard till now. Oh, so thank you, man. It, it was too beautiful. It. Amazing. But I, I have to say, I will, would have never played that solo if I wouldn't have been hearing all yes. this incredible percussion players through the day. I mean, there's no way, you know, I, I was in a completely different mind zone. Uh, and and completely influenced and adapted by by all the beautiful music I heard that day, which you know, India has one of the most profound musical cultures on the planet. So it, it was just really an honor to to be there and perform for for the Indian people. Man. Yeah, hopefully in twenty twenty one we should uh, plan something where we can uh, have you back in in Mumbai for sure. I'm anytime, <laughs> anytime. Amazing. Uh, one quick question about the current state of the jazz music across the globe, if you can talk about that. Uh, well, you know, jazz is just such a broad term now. You know, there's so many different kinds of jazz and currents uh, that I, I think jazz is, is at a good point in the sense that is really adapting to what's going on 
right. now. You know, there is so much mix with electronic music now, with uh, world music, with different kinds of uh, just sonic uh, possibilities. Um, and, and even in, in my own playing, my own composing, my own writing, my own producing, you know, I'm just mixing so many things now that to me, jazz, the word jazz for me just means freedom. Yeah. That's it. You know, I want jazz to give me the tools to be free, you know, because I feel like with jazz, you can fly. And once you can fly, you can do anything you want. You can go anywhere. So uh, if it's uh, if whatever I do or I write sounds like rock, cool. If it sounds like Mexican music, great. If it sounds like Indian music, fantastic. It uh, To me, it's just the ability to ride the waves of musical currents easily, like a surfer that really knows how to do. As a, as a jazz musician, you learn how to surf. You know, you right. learn about, about theory, you learn about rhythm, you learn about harmony, uh, and you learn about improvisation, you know, which uh, obviously music, uh, Indian music has a lot of improvisation without yes. necessarily being jazz, you know, and other kinds of music all over the world have tons of improvisation. So I'm not saying that jazz is the only music where you improvise. Not at all. But jazz really gives you the tools on how to make sense of, of how to build stories in your mind, build stories with your instrument that can help you write any musical wave. So to me, the most fun part now is collaborating with uh, sometimes musicians that absolutely have nothing to do with jazz, you know, yeah. that, uh, but I feel like jazz has given me the tools to be able to face absolutely any situation, you know, except, I mean, uh, let's say that whatever jazz does is that it really opens your, your mind and it really uh, teaches you how to listen right. and how to adapt. So I usually uh, talk about a jazz musician being somebody that is being comfortable, being uncomfortable. So if we think about that for a second is, you know, you're uncomfortable because you don't know what's going to happen. You, right. know, you are going to play with people and, you know, hopefully it's going to be cool, but you're comfortable with the idea because you know you have the skills necessary in order to face that situation. And, and I love being in situations where I have no idea what's going to happen. And then you know, just like you and me now, we know we're going to talk about drums. We're not yeah. going to talk about music, but I didn't know what you were going to ask me and you didn't know what I was going to answer. So it just yeah. becomes a conversation, right? And it's because you're listening and I'm listening. We're both listening and we, we both know what we're talking about. So when you get together with people that know what they're talking about and they're listening, you know, that's when the, the magic happens and it becomes a conversation. It becomes like a good soccer game you know, a good baseball game, a good hockey game, a good basketball basketball game where everybody passes the ball and everybody knows where they should stand and what, what to do. So jazz for me, that's what it means nowadays. Just freedom to express myself. That's all. Amazing. Uh, also, uh, what kind of music do you listen to like on a, on a, on a general basis? Like what are your current favorites? And, uh, uh, you know, uh, something that you would uh, also recommend drummers to listen to in the current scene? Well, of course, you know, if you want to be a jazz drummer, you have to listen to tons of jazz. You know, uh, in the beginning when I started playing jazz, I was not listening to that much jazz and everything that I sound that I played sounded weird. You know, it just didn't sound like I had the, the, the sounds of jazz in my head. So you get to listen to a lot of jazz and you're going to listen to a lot of rock if you want to be a rock musician. And you get to listen to a lot of Indian music if you want to be an Indian music musician. So, uh, you know, th those are things that, that, that we, we have to, to, to do, you know, to, um, but also to, to learn our, uh, and understand our own identity. You know, you grew up in a different way than I grew up. Yeah. So well, that's what makes us unique. You know, when I came to New York, I was like, how am I going to compete with this? You know, thousands of drummers that are incredible. Yeah. And I understood that, Having grown up in Mexico made me unique. Uh, having gone to Berkeley as a Mexican student uh, and then learning jazz made me unique. So those are, are kind of the, the, the things that um, 
uh, help you start finding your own voice, which I think in jazz especially is very, very, very important. You know, how to, to, uh, to understand your own individuality and exploit it. But I don't know if I uh, actually uh, answer your question. What was the question the, again? The current favorites, <laughs> what, what music are you listening to? Any particular band or any kind of, oh, yeah, song yeah. of today's, today's scene? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so uh, to me, it's, it's uh, really important for any musician, but especially I think jazz musicians, to listen to everything. You know, so uh, I, I go back and listen to a lot of things that I, you know, make me uh, uh, kind of homesick a little bit, you know, like listening to some of the rock stuff that I used to listen to when I was a kid. You know, I listen to a lot of the Beatles lately, a lot of Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, I, I listen to constantly. Uh, I listen to Rush and the Police constantly. Uh, and I, I love to listen to, to jazz. I listen to... Uh, there, there's a record that I've been listening to fairly often uh, called Train Plays the Blues, okay. you know, where Elvin Jones plays uh, drums. And, you know, it's just a beautiful, very soulful album yeah. because I feel sometimes jazz gets very complex yes. and uh, it's not music that I want to listen while I'm doing something else. But there are cer certain jazz records that you can listen to in the background and and you know it, it just really kind of enhances your your mood uh but I, I listen to a lot of uh groove music that has electronic elements in it right. uh one of my favorite bands as of late is a, a band from australia called hiatus coyote yes uh and uh, i love those guys you know i've i've uh Became fr I, I have become friends with uh, with them and and I really admire what they do. Nice. Uh, they have a very distinct uh, sound and a d very distinct approach. I, I love that. I listen to Stevie Wonder all the time. I've been listening to a lot of soul lately. Uh, Al Green and uh, Marvin Gaye and Donny Hathaway. You know, I, I love Aretha Franklin, uh, James Brown, of course. You know, I, I love listening to to all that stuff. Um, pop music sometimes it's a little disappointing uh, for me because it, it's just uh, a lot of it seems like a lot of icing on a very crappy cake you know <laughs> like there's not enough uh, cool things happening underneath but there's all this incredible production on right. top and and um, you know it, it it can sound impressive but then when you start examining you know there's not that much hey, there man. and I feel like uh, Somebody like Stevie Wonder, for example, uh, or Pat Metheny, for that matter, where there are incredible musicians that make very deep music, but that is accessible right. to people. So I think when you hit the jackpot is when a musician says, man, that's amazing. And then your aunt, who has no idea about anything about music, they're like, wow, I love that. Right. You know, that that's when you have. Uh, like a really high quality product. So, the, uh, you know, that's why there's only one Stevie Wonder, you know, Absolutely. And there, there, yeah. there's only one uh, Pat Metheny and there, there's, there's only one uh, of, of all the people that have actually achieved that combination. And I think Hiatus Coyote has a little bit of that. You know, yeah. musicians really dig it because it has very interesting things happening. Good balance. But, yeah. yeah, but then, you know, ordinary people listen to it and they, they really dig it. So... Uh, I think it's very important to keep your your ears open for all kinds of uh, music and classical music. Classical yes. music is really uh, a very good thing to listen to because it gives you a lot of ideas on how to develop all these motifs and telling a story. And then world music, of course, you know, Indian music, Brazilian music, Cuban music. I love Mexican music. I've been listening to a lot of uh, Son Jarocho. There's a very specific music from Veracruz. Which is okay. in the in the in the east coast of Mexico, and it has a very very distinct flavor, very syncopated with a harp. They improvise a lot, you know. It's it's just really cool to listen to all kinds of uh, of music if you can. Nice. Uh, there was another question from a student asking, "How can you sound unique and create your own voice? How do you work?" Yeah, on so it? so that's what I was talking about. You know, use your influences. Uh, I nowadays I use all my rock influences, my fusion influences, my classical music influences when I write, when I play, when I improvise, uh, because that's that's who I am. 
you know, I had a little bit of a, an identity crisis uh, when I was learning jazz because, okay, so now I'm a jazz musician. I should only be playing jazz. Right. And I was forgetting about all those things that made me who I am when I was a kid and when I was a teenager. Uh, and then when I started playing Latin music, I was like, okay, so now this is what I do. So I, I need to forget about classical music and I need to forget about rock and fusion. Yeah, no, it, it shouldn't work that way. Okay. I think if you want to become a jazz musician, fine, you have to really study jazz and the roots of jazz, any kind of music that has roots, you have to learn them. Uh, otherwise, you're going to sound like a bad version of, of, of a, a very deep kind of music. So okay. I learned the, the roots of jazz. Uh, and I'm still learning, you know, it's not like, oh, now, now I'm, I'm finished with that. I'm still okay. learning, but I'm mixing it up with my other uh, side, the other sides of my personality, who is who, who I am nowadays, you know. So if you see me playing a drum solo, you're going to hear some of Elvin Jones, some of Tony Williams, but yeah. then also some of John Bonham and some of Neil Peart and some of Stuart Copeland, and some of Ringo Starr, you know. Uh, and some Mozart in there too, you know, who, who, who knows? So that's what makes you unique. You know, when you start realizing that your influences is really what makes you be who you are. Okay. okay last two questions. Uh, so you are touring with, you know, so many other artists, you have your own setup. Uh, now you're doing scores, you, you program, uh, you know, for other productions and like uh, movies. How is it possible? How, how how do you manage time in like so many things happening at the same time? You know, touring and production. How do you balance? Yeah, that? I mean, it's it's hard. You know, uh, something always suffers, and usually what suffers is my mental state and my body. You know, because you're touring too much, you're doing too many things, and you don't you don't get enough rest, right. um, and you know you maybe you're not doing everything at the level that you could be doing because you're trying to do so many things so you know nowadays i've i found that it's very useful and helpful to say no to to certain things yes. you know because i have a very clear idea of what i want to do and a very clear idea of what i don't want to do anymore of course you know i've been doing this for for many years so i have that luxury and i have that vision in the beginning you should try to do Everything, Everything, you know, if they call you for any gig and you're really trying to learn and trying to get your feet wet in the industry, just do everything you can. But now, you know, I, I have to choose carefully what I want to do because I want to do it all the way and I want to do it the best way possible. And, and I feel like I have a reputation that I want to maintain uh, as a composer, as a drummer, as a producer. So uh, instead of just going into a studio and playing some standards with some friends and putting out a record, you know, I, I really take a long time making records now and, and thinking about what I want to do and uh, conceptualizing what I want to do. I want to really say something uh, every time I, I sit on the drums or every time you see me play on a stage. I want it to be like a special thing, you know. Uh, that's why also I don't want to be touring constantly with everybody. I want to tour my own thing. I love touring with Pat Metheny still, uh, but I'm really concentrating on, on my own uh, body of work. Uh, so, you know, saying no to things have, have, you know, been hard because a lot of times it's things that I want to do, but I know it's going to take uh, time away from me concentrating on, on my own vision now so you know it's it's a learning process but i i feel like i'm getting better every time amazing so what are the upcoming projects like i, I i'm sure like the touring is pretty much uh, not happening till at least the end of this year but yeah. other than that what are your upcoming projects so uh, when the pandemic started i was lucky that i was starting to work on this movie on harami yes. so uh, so that kept me occupied until maybe uh, two, three weeks ago that it finally ended. Okay. Um, but I, I got a, a call from Sham, the director, yesterday saying that he needed a couple extra things. So today I have to start working on, on a couple <laughs> uh, different scenes. Okay. Um, but I've been working on my new album, uh, which is super exciting because I did a, an album, um, well, it was 2017, called uh, Bad Hombre. Yes. So uh, this album was based on uh, improvisations, drum improvisations here in my studio. 
Then I chopped the improvisations and then I produced improvisations with tons of electronic sounds and voices and all kinds of crazy stuff. It was a very experimental album for yes. me. You know, just like trying different things and learning how to use the gear, learning how to use uh, recording techniques. It was all very new to me. So it was a really cool uh, thing to do. And also I did it all by myself. So, you know, I didn't need to schedule anything with anybody. I did it on my own time. So I wanted to do another one of those because last year I did a very complex album with my band Migration, which has been my kind of my, my main project uh, yes. for the last 10 years. So um, let, me, let me take this. I feel like. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, so um, now I'm working on Bad Ombre Volume 2, but I didn't okay. want to do the same thing. So what I'm doing now is I'm asking some of my favorite uh, singers that are not necessarily jazz singers to give me a tune that is either um, something that they had already written, something new, something, it can be a sketch, it can be a verse, it can be a chorus, anything. Give it to me and then let me do my thing with it. So uh, one of the most exciting things is that Trent Reznor from Nine Inch Nails agreed yes. to to give me a, a, a piece so i've been working on that lately and it's you know it's fantastic it's really cool oh. but the the nice thing is that i have permission from them to do whatever i want with that so uh, michelle and de was another idol of mine uh incredible singer bass player composer gave me a tune uh and it's a producer's dream because i have this incredible raw material that now I can mess with and do exactly how I please without having to ask for anybody's permission. So I've been working on that for the last uh, uh, year already, and it should come out at some point next year. I I'm going to be working on, on this for the rest of the year now. Amazing. Uh, one final question about uh, whatever message you want to give to all the upcoming uh, uh, generation of drummers and musicians who are kind of ready to enter the, the music scene. Yeah, well, you know, as we know, this is a, a you know, a very hard time for, for everybody, but especially for artists, you know, for musicians, because we cannot travel freely, therefore we cannot tour, and people cannot gather in, in places. So, you know, gigs, concerts, all of that is, uh, is on a holding pattern right now, unfortunately. So this is a hard uh, thing psychologically for us because we have, it seems like we have nothing to look forward to. Right. You know? So to practice for what? To write music for what? You know, there's no gigs, there's, there's nothing. So uh, it's very easy to fall into that, that mind trap that, you know, what's the point of doing anything right now? But we have to remember why we do what we do. Do we do it because we want other people to like it or do we do it because we just can't live without playing music? You know, I know it's something that I have to do. So there are some times where I go a week without touching the drums because I just don't feel like it. But then one day I'm like, wow, I really feel like I, I wanna play drums. And then I sit down and I play and I feel better. So we have to be aware that this is extraordinary circumstances. It's very easy to feel sad, to feel unproductive, to feel depressed, and that's okay. That's okay. We have to understand that if one day we don't feel like doing anything, we don't feel like practicing, we don't feel like writing, that's fine. That's fine. These are not normal circumstances. Uh, but I feel like maybe when things start coming back, then an amazing amount of work is going to come later. Uh, because musicians and artists, we grab inspiration from stimuli, right? So if we are not going out in the street, if we're not l watching other people perform, if we're not listening to music, if we are not talking to music, if we're not going to restaurants to eat a, an amazing meal, if we're not, uh, you know, having the social life that we usually have, then there's no stimuli, you know? So all the stimuli is from screens right now. We're staying home and everything we do is through a screen. And that can become very, very tiresome. So my advice is just be good to yourself. Try to eat healthy right now. Try to work out. You know, don't 
let yourself go. You know, try try to get yourself into some kind of routine that will make you feel good. And uh, and and when you can't do any of the things that I just said, it's okay. Don't feel bad about it. You know, don't feel bad about it. Uh, I think it things will will start uh, feeling normal at some point, hopefully. Uh, but in the meantime, just we have to be good to ourselves and, and make sure that we're healthy, wear masks. You know, there's a lot of people here in the United States that uh, the mask wearing has has become a contentious issue. Like, oh, well, it's, you know, is my freedom not to use it? Well, yeah, idiot, but your freedom might get me sick. So wear masks, be responsible, be good to one another. And uh, and I think we're we're going to come out of this on the other side. Amazing. Dorios, thank you so much. I think this is, uh, has been my longest uh, session with any artist, but I really wanted to do this. And there's so much, so much in information. And, you know, uh, just talking to you has been so much inspiring for me as a musician. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, you, I, I really hope to see you in, in Mumbai someday soon. Let's do it, man. We, yeah. we have to do another hang and you take me yeah. around and, and uh, we try not to crash against uh, other people while we're driving. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but seriously, you know that India, uh, you know my India experience has been always incredibly beautiful. I I took uh, well, my wife and I went there for a honeymoon. We went to Mumbai. We went to uh, New Delhi, oh, and okay. uh, Maestro Sakir organized this whole trip to the Taj Mahal in Agra. So yeah. you know, it's I'm I'm uh, in love with India. Every time I, I go there, I hope to come come back soon. And thank you to all my friends that tune in. Uh, it's been uh, a pleasure talking to you and let's do it again some sometime soon. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Take right, care. Take care, brother. Stay safe. Bye. Bye. Wow. What an incredible session. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in. Uh, both of these episodes are going to be on the channel. Um, what an incredible guy, man. Uh, and so much, uh, so much to get inspired from a person like this. And, uh, you know, please follow his music, do buy his music, go to his YouTube channel. Um, you know, this is the, the best way to support musicians, drummers, you know. And uh, I will see you next week with uh, another incredible, incredible talent from India. And, uh, you know, please support Indian musicians. And as he said, it's a, it's a rough time for all of us. So we got to be with each other and, uh, you know, just go through this time as soon as possible. Yeah. Thank you. God bless.